Hello and welcome to Distillations, weekly extracts from the past, present, and future of chemistry. I'm Mayor Rindy. On today's show, we hope to get your stomach growling as we talk about the chemistry of eating. We'll awaken your taste buds with a history of the fifth taste and tempt your palate with a poem on the fruits of the West Indies. That's all coming up on today's episode of Distillations. Eating is the focal point of most of our days and something we can't live without. Getting a good meal can be a great pleasure for our palates, but the nutrients we take in are, of course, crucial to our health. Bob Kenworthy takes a closer look at one vital mineral in today's Element of the Week. The U.S. National Academy of Science recommends the average adult male consume at least 420 milligrams of magnesium each day. Adult women need only 320 milligrams unless they're pregnant, in which case they need 40 milligrams extra. Fortunately, magnesium is readily available in a variety of foods, including leafy green vegetables, nuts, whole grains, and certain fish. But even so, only a third of Americans are getting their recommended dose of magnesium. So what are they missing? Magnesium is an alkaline earth metal. It appears in the second column of the periodic table just above calcium, which means it behaves very much like calcium in chemical reactions and in the body. Like calcium, magnesium ions appear in the bones and teeth, and it's been shown to be important in cellular communication channels. Although magnesium deficiency diseases are fairly rare, low levels of the ion have been associated with muscle spasms, high blood pressure, migraines, and anxiety disorders. It's essential to plant function, too. Magnesium ions are at the center of the chlorophyll complex, which is why green vegetables are such a good source of the mineral. But, you say, you don't like kale, collard greens, spinach, chard, or any of the other miracle vegetables chock full of magnesium? Not to fear. Magnesium ions are very soluble in water, and they lend their sour flavor to mineral waters and untreated hard water. Magnesium is also the third most abundant ion in seawater after sodium and chloride. And therefore, a dash or two of sea salt might just be enough to tip the magnesium scale in your favor. And that's it for the Element of the Week. I'm Bob Kenworthy. Bob Kenworthy is CHF's Manager of Affiliate Relations. We want our food to be healthy, of course, but more than that, we want it to be tasty. So what makes something delicious? Sugar and spice, salt and pepper, a squeeze of lemon juice or a dash of Tabasco? Chefs have a word for delicious, umami. It's not a taste, but rather a chemical that creates what's known as mouthfeel. Producer Ari's Keck explains in today's Mystery Solved. As the steam rises from a bowl of Japanese noodle soup, little bits of deep green seaweed lazily bump into long, fat noodles. Breathe in, and there's a slightly smoky, roasted fish flavor. This base, called dashi, is the foundation of Japanese cooking. In the early 1900s, Japanese chemist Kunai Ikeda decided to determine exactly what made dashi delicious. He dissolved the roasted seaweed and boiled it down into an extract, evaporating the water again and again. Akedo was left with a neutral white crystalline powder. He treated the powder with ethanol, hydrogen sulfide, silver sulfate, barium oxide, refining and defining, pulling out everything from the chemist's bag of tricks. Finally, a very slow-growing crystal formed. After a week, it was the size of a grain of rice. Akedo brought it to his mouth and bit down. In his 1908 paper describing the discovery, Ikeda writes that the crystals displayed a peculiar taste of seaweed broth with a little sourness. He named his discovery umami, after the Japanese word for delicious. The chemical behind this new taste is glutamate. There's a whole industry involved with this. Dr. Robert Henkin is a neuroendocrinologist and is the founder of the Taste and Smell Clinic in Washington, D.C. Umami is a so-called fifth taste, and It really is not a taste per se, but the perception of mouth feel. It does have a taste character. It's like metallic has a taste character, but it's not the same. 
One hundred years after Kunai Ikeda's experiments, biochemists identified the actual receptors on the taste buds in our mouths that respond to glutamate. What happens is that the tastant, which you're going to taste, has to bind to the receptor on the bud, and the amplification process will cause the information to be then transmitted along the nerve into the brain. In other words, the tongue tells the brain to say yum. French chefs are somewhat less concerned with the chemistry, but they do care a lot about taste. Restaurateur Bernard Grenet roasts veal bones to create his umami-rich sauces. Yeah, you roast them for, you know, a couple of hours in the oven with uh, all carrots and onions, then you, it's cooked for 24 hours, overnight, slowly. Just extract all the uh, flavor from the bones, the veal bones, and um, the day after we just, you know, strain the juice, and this is our veal stock. This broth has the same L-glutamate compounds as the bowls of Japanese soup that inspired Kunai Ikeda, and it's the same chemical as the fine white powder of MSG. Ikeda patented the process for making monosodium glutamate in 1909, and by the 1970s, MSG had become a common ingredient in American Chinese cooking. That is, until people started complaining of MSG headaches. Taste researchers believe that the MSG effect may actually be sensory overload. Our brain's receptors become overwhelmed by too much L-glutamate, and that overload causes a headache. But other researchers have found time and time again that the MSG effect doesn't happen at all. In other words, it's all in our heads. Glutamate is all over our food. Mushrooms, beans, seared meat, and broths are loaded with it. It's an intrinsic part of soy sauce, of Marmite in Australia, of Goiza Sazan in the Caribbean, of ranch dressing, and of a bologna sandwich. In fact, nacho cheese-flavored Doritos contain five separate forms of glutamate. Glutamate, it's the chemical that makes food delicious. For Distillations, I'm Aries Keck. Have comments or questions about something you've heard on our show? Send your thoughts to distillations at chemheritage.org. You're listening to Distillations. I'm Mayor Rindy. When food is really, truly good, it can inspire poetry. Such was the case with John Singleton when he visited the West Indies in the 1760s. He was so moved by the rich, juicy streams of the ripe sugar cane plant and the sweetly poignant fruits of the islands, he wrote a book about it. Gigi Naglak reads us an excerpt from Book One of Singleton's A General Description of the West Indian Islands. In high perfection here, that plant uprears its verdant blade, whose yellow ripened stem pours its rich, juicy streams abundant forth and from its worth bestows increasing power, plenty, and ease on its impatient lord. Sweetened by this all-wondrous plant, each fair, the favorite Chinese shrub, with pleasure tastes. Not so intemperate man its juice employs, but its nutritious quality, for good designed, to shameful purposes perverts. He from the chemic still extracts a fiend, when by excessive drafts he dims the light of reason, prime prerogative of man. The intoxicated brain by vapors filled hurls wisdom headlong from her rightful throne, and scenes of hapless riot oft ensue. Nor does Pomona here with scanty hand heap on the damasked board her ripened fruits delicious and of flavor exquisite, fruits not unworthy European soils. Cool water lemons to the feverish guest hold forth their grateful moisture and invite the gatherer's hand. Whilst, yielding to the touch, the scented fruits enrich their bending vines. The sweetly poignant granadilla here spreads its broad leaf, advancing fast in growth, till with its weight the vine prolific groans. There, ripening melons strew unsheltered beds, and to perfection without art arrive. Distent with nectar, rich pomegranates burst, and in due season yield a grateful taste. Here pearly avocados plenteous hang, whose rinds with vegetable marrow swell. The lofty tamarind, whose fruit encased to thirst in flicking beverage affords, far overarching spreads its umbrage brown and to the weary traveler extends an ample shade at Saul's meridian glow. The cocoa, too, with rugged trunk deformed, winds the air its long, unwieldy bulk, 
or shoots oblique in many a wanton line, and, scorning order, mocks the planter's care. Forth from the nut flows cool nectarious juice, such as a god would scarce refuse to taste, though Ganymede should not present the cup. Now let us yonder fragrant grove survey, where hangs the orange, rich in burnished gold, and by the fair seems eager to be plucked. And last, though justly deemed the first in praise, the luscious pine, of humble growth indeed, but of majestic form. Its metered head uprears, ambrosial fruit, its sculptured coat, diversified by nature's hand, contains all fruits comprised in one. Its flavors rich by heaven upon itself alone bestowed, not those which in Alcinius's garden bloomed, nor those which grace our European soil and ripen beauteous on the funny wall when Saul with Virgo riding autumn brings, could e'er the royal Indian pine excel. Happy inhabitants of these blessed climes, did they but know their own delights to prize? Gigi Naglak is a curatorial assistant at CHF. Thanks to Anna Foy, a visiting scholar at CHF, for drawing our attention to the poem. And that's it for this episode of Distillations. Distillations is a presentation of the Chemical Heritage Foundation and is made possible by the generous support of the Richard Lounsbury Foundation. Mia Lobel is our senior producer. Our associate producer is Victoria Indeviro, and our executive producer is Audra Wolf. Our theme music is composed and performed by Dave Kaufman. Additional music provided from the Podsafe Music Network. Check it out at music.podshow.com. Please tell us what you think about our program and send suggestions for future shows to distillations at chemheritage.org. Until next time, I'm Mayor Rindy. <laughs>